What happens when law, business, and life collide? Each week on Lead Council, your host Tom Tona will take a deep dive into topics related to the law, the business of law, and life. There will be insightful discussions with industry insiders, experts, and thought leaders making significant contributions and meaningful differences in their fields of expertise. Tom is the founder and managing attorney at Tona Law. He has been a practicing attorney since 1994 and the leader of Tona Law since it opened in 2001. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with free information on law and the business of law and to give you actionable tools related to each of these areas. Now, here's Tom. Hey, welcome to the Lead Council Podcast. I'm here with Juliet. Jules, what's going on? Hello, welcome back. I'm excited for today's episode. I am too. I am too. So Jennifer Gore Cuthbert, uh, I've been following her a lot on social media, on other podcasts. And, you know, Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. You're welcome. And I I was excited to meet with you and I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. So one, you know, I'm like a typical middle-aged law partner, right? 55 years old. And I was talking to other middle-aged law partners who were all, all big in marketing and we're all like, man, that Jennifer Gore Cuthbert person out of Atlanta, Georgia, man, she came on the scene like gangbusters, like just out of the gate. And all of a sudden, everybody across the country knew your name. So I was like super impressed. I'm like, but I swear to you, we were talking about it at a mastermind I was at. And I hope to start seeing you at some more masterminds where I can crisscross and meet you in person. But I was super excited. I started following you. And one, you're in a very competitive market. You're a personal injury uh, attorney and founder of the Atlanta Personal Injury Law Firm, right? Uh, You're also a coach and an author. So you're in a hyper-competitive market. You're a woman. So I know there's challenges in the legal field with that and then in the personal injury space with that. And you've kind of taken no prisoners, man. You're coming at it. You are coming at it. And I love that about you. You know I'm from New York. Are you? Yeah. I did not know that. What part it of New York? It makes sense now, doesn't it? Yes. It you really resonate with me because you're like, I always joke around people. I'm like, I'm a refreshing punch in the face if you don't know me. Right? Like, that's how I refer to myself. So it's that New Yorker vibe. You know, Seth Price, same thing. Um, so when, where are you from in New York and when did you move to Atlanta? So I grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is like an hour and a half-ish north of Manhattan. And um, I went to high school there. I was a collegiate rower. Uh, I rode in high school on the Hudson River. And my parents wanted to retire to Florida, like all New Yorkers (laughs) one day dream to do. And so my senior year of high school, we moved to Florida which was not my favorite thing ever. Okay. And so then I went back, I did one year of high school in Florida and then I went back to college in New York. Where'd so you go I to went college? to I went to Marist College. Okay. And uh, I went to business school and um I ended up going to law school in Atlanta and that is how I got you know, I kind of was getting tired of going back and forth from New York to Florida. So Atlanta was kind of a compromise to be closer to my family, but I didn't want to live in Florida. So, um, you know, I ended up loving Atlanta. The South has been really good to me. I feel like um, just the work ethic that I developed in New York um, has served me so well here because when I was 14, my dad took me to get my working papers in New York and I started my first job. So you know, a lot of people in New York are very used to working one, two, three jobs. Right. And I mean, because it's a necessity. <laughs> you can't live in New York City without working multiple jobs. Right. Long um, Island, too. Long Island, too, where we are. It's crazy. It kind of forces you to hustle. Yeah. It's a hustle culture. I mean, there's some things that I do like think are now looking back, like are tough about living in New York. Like, Like I'm so friendly and I think that is actually better for me in the South. Like people are so friendly. Like when I go to New York, I'm like, okay, (laughs) don't make eye contact. Like I'll be on the train and I'll be like, hello. And people are like, gosh, like you've been at the South too long. Like (laughs) I'm, I'm really friendly. And I think that 
is not work well in New York. <laughs> well, look, whatever it is, you definitely have that competitive edge. I mean, you've been, how long have you been in practice? So we just celebrated our 11 year anniversary. Nice. So, um, yeah, 11 years we started in 2013 and, uh, I, you know, we've just been rolling. I mean, I actually like, I don't know where I thought we would be at year 10 or 11, but I'm, I'm proud of the company we've built and what we're, you know, what we're turning it into. And yeah, listen, uh, just to give you kind of a measuring stick. Um, so you, you've been recognized as the fastest growing in the U S Inc 5,000. I know that that's like a legit award, right? And <laughs> yeah. I know, cause I'm 55, 24 years in business. And we just applied for it for the first time this year. And I was like, Oh, this is no joke, right? Like getting the, if you, if it's an Inc 5,000 list, whether it's best workplaces or, you know, uh, any of the awards that you're talking about, for anybody that's listening to this, you actually really have to qualify. Like there's real there's standards no, to it. There's no pay to play here, you know? No, it's, no. It's this award. is not like you're the best attorney awards. This is a real award. And so you've done some pretty intensely accelerated growth of your firm, just seeing that you have those accolades, right? I think that that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I, you know, am so lucky and blessed that I have had some of the best mentors in the industry. Um, I just force them to be my mentors. <laughs> um, I like that. I was like, hi. I think um, one of them, I was just like, hi, you're my new mentor. And you know, <laughs> I really do think that that works well. Um, I love to study other people and see other people that I think are successful and try to replicate what they're doing and put my own spin on it. But I would not be where I am now. I mean, th the second year I was in business, I went and got business coaching and, you know, I have no problem being like, I don't know anything I need to learn and put the ego to the side. Like I want, I just want to get better. And it's also really important to surround yourself by people who are doing more than you, who are, you know, more profitable, have more stable teams because they will inspire you. And, and in the difficult times, you'll be like, it's possible because this person's doing it, you know? Yeah. And so I always try to, the other thing is you kind of have to sometimes like what gets you to one level is not what takes you to the next level. So, you know, you might be in a business coaching program that's working really well. And then like you kind of get to the end of it and it's no longer making you challenged. And then you have to be able to say goodbye and walk away to go to the next thing. And that's right. also hard. And that's a muscle you got to flex because a lot of people are not, I could even speak for myself like that. That's still something that's hard for me. And I don't really have trouble with boundaries or anything like that, but uh, yeah, in that context, you're talking about because you develop a relationship. You also got to say, is it have I reached my maximum? Is it on to the the next, next. thing? And but, before, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, every time I've ever walked away, like something else immediately shows up. Yes. Yeah. And that's the same I find, especially even in the business world, right? Like, so somebody leaves that you thought you could not function without, and then all of a sudden you're hiring two levels up and you go, Oh, there's different levels and this is awesome. And yes, I was nervous. And it's just, it's always a dude. It's a, it's a messy thing. Entrepreneurship, right? Cause it screws with your emotions. It screws oh, yeah. with your brain. And like, I always joke around like the broken brain complex. Like I, I, I a mutual friend of ours, Bill Umansky, um, Love Bill. Love we Bill. joke, we joke around me too. And, and we joke around about that broken brain thing all the time. Like you really, if you're not, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't question your sanity at least several times a week, I question whether you're authentically an entrepreneur. I really do, man. I, am I wrong, Jennifer? Am I wrong? I, I think I literally posted something today was like, um, you don't want people to think you're normal. You want people to think you're wildly crazy because you're so passionate about right. your bit your business, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Um I do think that having a business is the greatest personal development journey you can go on if you view it that way. Um, yes. And if you put in that kind of work, it requires that intensive 
coaching, psychology, all of that intensive labor that a lot of people also are not willing to do, you know? And like, you have to also make your peace with the fact like it's never going to be done. Like, right. My business is so much better than it was five years ago or two years ago. I have totally different problems, but like, there's still problems. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. And I, 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 it's funny. I'm looking at your face and the face you just made when you said that is my internal feelings 98% of the time as I'm growing into an eight figure firm. Like if you had asked me in 2001, when I opened up, would you love these problems? I would have said yes. And now that I have these problems, I go, man, I had it pretty good with a laptop. I settled a case for 300 grand. I could live on that hundred grand for two, three, four, five months. It's different now. That's not- The pressure you know. was less. The pressure yeah. was less. But for me, you know, I started the firm when my daughter was two months old. And uh, I just feel like a lot of solo practitioners, I live that life very briefly you pay in other ways. You pay with your time. You pay in the fact that you know you're chained to the desk. Like if you don't build a business, then like I can leave. I actually on my third child left and this whole firm was run without me for two and a half months. Most yeah. lawyers could never experience that. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they're, they're, they think, oh, they don't have pressure. They don't have any responsibility, but they have every weight of the whole business on them. And you'll see when they're on vacation, they're on their phone, maybe typing a brief or whatever they're doing. They're not really, I mean, nobody creates a business so that they have zero freedom. Right. I mean, the might, well, that was one of my primary drivers, right? But it's got to be a scalable business to have that freedom. Right. You have to have leverage points. Otherwise, your fax machine on vacation, like you said, the cell phone. And to me, that was not I was not building a job. It was going to be a scalable thing. So, yeah, and I know that that's your mindset as well. Yeah, I just feel like you start to resent the business. I coach a couple different lawyers and um, I can see it like when you never have a break, when you never can step away, or you know that there's going to be a cost for you taking a vacation, you yeah. tend to take less vacations. You tend to do less things that are important to do as a human. And then you tar start to resent the company. Like I, I didn't want to go that route, you know? Right. Because you're not, you're, what you're talking about is people that are building a job. It's just another job, right? And now it's the worst kind of job because you have no security and no you security. are, you are like, at least if you have a paycheck coming in, you're working for somebody, you have that security. So I kind of feel like when you, uh, make the decision to hang a shingle, you're either creating a job or you're creating a business and you have to be willing to go through those different pain stages like you were talking about to build that business. So I was literally on the phone the other day, this guy that I mentor, he was like a newly graduated law student and he kept trying to like ask me like, so like if I just kept it small, like would it be less stressful? And he's like, you know, trying to negotiate with me. Like, well, I'm like, well, if you keep it small, here's your poison. If you keep it big, here's your point. Like pick your right. poison there. Right. Like, this is not like, this is not for the faint of heart, either way you cut it because no, you're it's going not. to have to choose which journey you go on. And I think how you just said it is very, really a good way to look at it. Are you building yourself a job or are you building a company? Because they're actually different skill sets. Right. Yeah. And building a job, there's nothing wrong with being a solopreneur, right? Where you have a maximum amount of hours you could ever put in. It's not scalable. It revolves around you. And you may have slightly more freedom because you might get slightly more PTO and you might make more money. But then again, you have more risk, right? More risk. Versus building a business where, you know, we're speaking the same language. It's different. There's leverage points there. Are you, are you handling files at all anymore? Not really anymore because um, good for you. I, I used to be the managing attorney. We now have a managing attorney. Um, we have the managing attorney, and she's double the years in practice that I am in. And awesome. we have a litigator who's twenty five years in practice. I mean, she's a better litigator than I am. Right. So it's like when you hire people that are smarter than you, like. 
I don't have the need to like insert myself in those ways. I mean, I'm in the loop. I know what's going on. I'm part of um, all the attorney, like we do round tables yeah. where we round table cases and everybody kind of looks at our top 10% of our cases and strategizes. But um, the, I, di- I don't want to hire amazing people and then try to like hamper them or like right. make them listen to me. Like I want to really empower them and, you know, they kind of report out to me and say, this is what we're, what we're going to do. And, um, you know, we have like fail safes and checks and balances in, in place, but I do not want, I do, I don't have the need to be the number one attorney in this firm. Right. Me neither. And, and just to echo that, I have to give you props. You changed my game and I'm going <laughs> to tell you why I'm going to tell you why. And I, I can learn from anybody, right? The fact that I've been doing this 30 years means nothing if I'm not humble enough to say there are superstars out there that can teach me things at every level. Right. So, uh, I was listening to you on Umansky's podcast, uh, the, the, just a plug for Umansky, the lawman's lounge. And Love I was you. really struggling with, um, you know, how do I replace myself in my personal injury silo? And you brought up a dilemma that you wrestled with, which was why would anybody want to work for me that has trial experience, decades of it or whatever. And then you said the magic words and you're like, cause I'm the one that gets the cases. So I took that and made it my New York foul mouth. I'm the mother that gets the cases. And I was like, Jen, you are my hero for, for you want, planting you want to that know, seed. I'm so glad you resonated with that in that way because so every, much. that is actually a skill set that if you're good at rainmaking, which I think you are, I oh, am, yeah, 100%. If you're good at bringing in business, you tend to under like value that and think like, oh, like anyone can do that just because it's right. naturally easy for you. But I went around and talked to tons of litigators and like they're amazing, incredible but their biggest fear is how to keep the cases coming in. Yep. And second off, like they, to, to keep great attorneys, you have to be able to feed them great cases. Like yes. all litigators, their secret dream is just to work on the best cases. Yes. And, yeah. and they really struggle if they're a solo on their own to be able to be incredible at doing this and rainmaking. That's very rare. If you want to be a superstar in, especially let's talk about personal injury space, you better be trying cases on the regular and taking big verdicts, or you better be a real savvy business person that has studied law firm business and scaling and has some level of mastery over it, right? Because like when I talk about core values, I see people in my market. They're, they're trying to knock off my core values. I'm like, you're the same guy that threw a laptop across the office. You don't think that your, your people are applying to me and then telling everybody what you do. Right. So yeah, I, you know, listen, that's what I really love about the internet and LinkedIn and, and the social media stuff, especially the people I follow like you, where, man, you putting out so much value and, and it doesn't matter if you're 10 years out and I'm, 30 years out, I took so much value out of that conversation that you had. It was a game changer for me. So thank you for that. I appreciate that because it's not to me age. It doesn't matter. Like we have created tribes, like our friends, like Bill and all the people in the masterminds. And like, I learned from people at all different ages, but it's that we all kind of had that same want to get better mindset. You know? Yeah. So let me ask you a question about the, let me ask you a question about the masterminds that you attend. Cause you attend a lot of trial technique masterminds. I attend all them almost exclusively business. I will attend like if Ryan McKean's throwing something, I'm going because I love those outlier type of, um, things that they accomplished. But so is there a reason that you, you, I know I see you at a lot of the personal injury trial specific stuff. Yeah. So what's the, what's the was, strategy there? What's the okay, strategy there? So I would say I'm, I'm in only a couple trial ones. I'm in a lot more business ones for sure. Okay. Um, okay. I'm in a lot of private masterminds. I'm in, um, I go to a lot of conferences, but I do participate in AAJ, which I kind of think is more trial. I've gone to Lanier. That's really like a conference. Right. Um, and I always took the perspective that one day I'm going to lead and command a large volume of trial lawyers. And so I want to understand the mindset. I want to 
understand the motivations. I want to be like really connected to them because they are a key component of building an incredible personal. I agree. Firm. I agree. And so, and that was one of the epiphanies I had with Ryan McKean where I got kind of um, complacent. You can make a lot of money. Like I tried cases when I was a younger attorney. So you can make a lot of money if you set up systems around that stuff, but you got to keep you. You got to be fresh. Have, you got to stay in the game, right? So you got to keep those trials happening, even if it's not you doing them, right? hundred percent. A hundred percent. So, so I, and I like also that. like I have had a very easy time standing out when I go, like I was just this past weekend at trial lawyer university in Huntington beach. I'm often one of the very few female attorneys there. There's a couple. Yes. So like everyone ends up knowing me and I think like, like Rex Paris, he's one of my mentors. You guys know Rex. Yes, he's yes. In some of the largest verdicts, I mean, I'm hanging out with Rex Paris, Brian Panish. Like these are guys have gotten highest verdicts in the United States. Yep. And then I can text Rex right now and be like, Rex, I need your help, and he would help me. Like that's a tremendous resource just to have them where they can co-counsel with you on big cases. Yeah, too. like his team has said, like whatever you need, our team will help you. So like. Business is relationships. Go yes. to the spaces where people aren't going. Don't always do the obvious thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I attribute it to some of my mentors. I noticed they were going. So I was like, oh, one of the things about Trial Lawyer University is that you can send your attorneys there and they can get mentored by some of the greatest trial lawyers in America and build those re relationships. So I feel like if I if I'm sending people from my team, I should go on behalf of the firm. Um, and you know, like there's always something to learn. And I don't feel weird that I'm not the lead trial lawyer when I go there because a lot of people already recognize me from social media. Right, right, right. right. And they are like I've actually picked up three or four um, coaching clients of trial lawyers when I've gone to those events as well. Because for the business side, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's pretty smart. I'll tell you that uh, I'm like you. I'm kind of all over the place and I travel a lot. I, I just think it's brilliant the way you're doing it. And I was just kind of curious about that strategy, but now that you're saying it, it makes total sense. It makes total sense. Um, so shift gears because I know a big thing that you're also always talking about is branding and personal branding, which personal again, branding. personal branding. So as a woman who is competing in a traditionally male dominated space, personal injury, I mean, it's the most testosterone driven space ever. And, but I do think you have a really secret weapon in the way you're doing it. Plus it's that, that Southern, you know, you got that Southern hospitality smile and niceness. So like you got this secret weapon, but you're a very shrewd businesswoman. I know I can tell. It's very Dolly Parton. Well, how do you define your personal brand? Um, you know, I went to business school for marketing and branding and I always like, have <laughs> okay, felt okay. like marketing comes pretty easily to me. And I'm like always blown away that people don't understand, like you have to create the caricature the brand, the feeling, how people feel when they're around you, that like you are a brand. And if you don't take hold of that brand and design it, it will get designed organically by somebody else. So, you know, how you dress, um, the things you do, the to topics you talk about, like people want to be able to be like, Tom is this, and I can put him in this box and like, that's where he lives. And if you right. make it hard for people, you're not building a really great brand. Um, so yeah, like it just, it's something that we've tried to be really consistent on. And I mean, as far as like being in a male dominated um, industry, I really, I just think whatever makes you unique is your judo move. It's your, I actually look at being a woman as such an advantage. Um, I mean, it is. I, it is. I, I think it is. I, in fact, I'm going to tell you, I have some guy friends that are like younger guys that are alpha and I'll like take them with me and I'll be like, let's go to this event and I'll introduce you to all my mentors. And most, a lot of my mentors are men. And like, I notice, and this is like super taboo. Like the men will be like, Jen, come on in. 
And then like to the young buck, like alpha guy, they're like, oh, why are you here? You right, know? right, like right, the, right, right. Older alpha men do not want the younger <laughs> alpha guy. As an older alpha What guy, is the deal? So look, it's kind of like if you, so we heard a speaker and we'll get into this in a minute, but we heard a speaker say, uh, his name was Bert, uh, what was Bert's last name? Bert Thornton. We heard him at Pilma and Bert wrote a book called find yourself an old gorilla, meaning find yourself that eight figure player, that mid to eight figure player who's been there, done it for 20 years. Right? So yeah, that's, I'm an old gorilla, right? I'm a small gorilla, but I'm an old gorilla. So you think I want to deal with some kid's attitude who's two years out of school? He's going to give me his swagger. He's going to tell me how he deserves swagger after the punches in the face that I've taken over the last 30 years. They, but like, if I was like, hey, Tom, will you help me? I'm going to be like, Jen, come on in. Yeah, we'll sit down. Let me show so you how brilliant everything is. I swear. I, I've just revealed all my secrets right here. <laughs> right, right, right. That's awesome, though. <laughs> no, so, it's like it's like I didn't really know this phenomenon was happening until I started trying to like bring my guy friends in. And I started to notice like, oh, they're getting a different reaction. I feel like everyone's so welcoming. <laughs> I think it, but it's all in approach. Um, I, I mentor a lot of younger attorneys um, and it really is an approach. That's the message that people should hear is like, if you want to be mentored, which is the greatest hack in the world is to find people yes. who have already done what you're trying to do. Be absolutely humble. You know, I try to always provide value to my mentors, whether I can connect them with somebody that they want to be connected with Same. or I don't waste their time. Like if they tell me you should do something, I don't, Oh, ignore that advice. And then come back with the same question. Right. Like it really annoys people if they give you their time and then you just throw their advice out. Yeah. Um, or you fight with them as to why they're wrong after you ask for the advice. Right? I yeah. call those people assholes. They I'm like, you love <laughs> when you come back and you're like, I did exactly what you said. Now what? And then people right. will pour into you. I think there's an art to developing mentors and coaches and getting people to want to help you. And I think that the way you interact shows that you value it or you don't. So that swagger, that alpha thing you're talking about, some of the most accomplished people that I'm in the room, it's kind of like the black belts in my jujitsu class. The baddest dudes in the room are the one with the biggest smiles with nothing to prove. So exactly. like you'll, you'll never hear me swaggering. You'll never hear anybody in the circles that we run it. You run in the same circles swaggering. Right. They're running $20 million a year love from thin on swagger. They're because humble. They they're know nice. They could be at 80 million. You know? They also know that in the swipe of a pen or something goes wrong, they could be at 3 million. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A bad year. And you're at, you're at a million COVID I, hit and your revenue got cut in half. I think a lot about like how, when I was younger, I thought I knew so much more. Like now I'm turning 40. I almost feel like I, like the older you get, you feel like, you know, nothing. <laughs> well, you know, again, too, you're, you're, you're super humble and you're very authentic in your social media. And I think that that, what, that's what makes you, you know, an overshare. People, yes. Well, no, I think people want to listen. People want real, right? So like I watch you, I'm like, I can't believe I'm watching her reels of her working out with her, with her Nike dunks on. But like, this is me at four 30 in the morning. I'm working out. You know, I don't have a fashionable sneaker game like you, but you, you know what I'm saying? Like you just, you're putting out stuff that kind of resonates with the lifestyle that certain people want to lead. You know, I go to bed early so I can work out. I have kids. I have a kid. I have a daughter. So I want to be home for dinner with her. So I work out at 430 in the morning. So there's a lot of, okay, I could connect with what Jen's about. Right. And then and you see your friends working out. Like a couple of my friends post videos. I'm like, shit, I gotta like, don't. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, that's my thing. I'm serious about that. Like, I never want to fall off the bandwagon. And like, I'm like, I see Deidre working out. So like, yeah, like today was my day off. I'm going back tomorrow, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it's definitely inspirational. So yeah.